basic concepts regarding mice, regarding animal experimentation. So again, as I mentioned before, uh, so stop me when you have the questions, okay? So the course, essentially these are, are more or less the topics we are going to, to listen to in the course and by different uh, research and stuff today we are going to listen to Daniela Marazzitti who I have just presented, also Federica Benvenuti, Fabio Reggia who is here and then we are, coming, we are going to have a couple of talks from, from, <coughs> from you, okay? And then during the course you have the program, so you can have a look at the program uh, in, in which different people will, will come to, to present. Uh, there, there may be also some changes that this is the, the preliminary problem. So the, the first question is, in my opinion, could be this one. So why we are here? This is essentially the question. What is a modern organism? Uh, why do we use mice? I don't know if you have an idea of that. Uh, so why we are interested in, in doing research in animals? Why don't we use a simpler model? Or why don't we use flies that are much cheaper and much faster? And uh, we also can do a lot of experiments with that. So. What is a model organism? One definition could be that a non-human species we cannot use. So obviously, in our case, we are trying to model a human, in which, for obvious reasons, we cannot perform a, a series of studies. We can do some studies in humans, population studies, but we cannot do many, many studies. So we have to model a human into another organism uh, in which to study disease, physiology, the role of genes and uh, in many cases let's say we cannot use cell culture to study these things so we cannot use humans so in that case we need models and the models what should be the, the models should be let's say when we work in the, in the laboratory, they should be easy to maintain and breed, so if this complicated, then they are not useful. Then we need, normally for doing experiments, a large number of, of animals, and they should, let's say, have a, a relatively short generation time. And obviously resemble a human. So these are some of the model organisms that are normally used in the laboratory, C. elegans, uh, Rosophila melanogaster, or zebrafish, mice, uh, and even primates, non-human primates. So obviously each species has advantages and disadvantages. So we can use any of these because they are very simple to use. We have a very strong uh, genetic uh, system to uh, to modify the genome in, in those uh, organisms, or we can go for more complex organisms. Uh, we are going to, to hear today a lot about uh, larger organisms. And uh, mice, in any case, they are a good system because they are relatively more closely related to humans. We have to keep this, let's say, between uh, brackets because a mouse is not a human in any case. We have a relatively reduced cost and uh, generation time is relatively fast. And this is also very important. These two last uh, considerations are very important because now we have a lot of strength which the, 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 in which the sequence of the complete genome is available. You can find all the animals here. And also it is nowadays it is possible and relatively simple and fast to manipulate the human the, the, the genome. Okay? Obviously we, one advantage is that uh, we can study many uh, many characteristics, biochemistry, biology, physiology, 
okay, we can use to study human diseases. And we can also have uh, animals with a very, very controlled uh, genetic background uh, in which to study the disease and uh, attribute the problem to the specific gene. That is not possible in other organisms because of uh, differences in genetic background. Okay, and also we have the possibility, since we, we know that this animal will develop a disease, go earlier in time to determine markers or the first uh, mechanism which are going on in, in to, to later develop the disease. So, what is important to know is also that the, the, the phenotype of the animal is very, very strain dependent. Different strains may have different phenotypes. And uh, this is crucial when we design an experiment. We know that the animals, more or less the mice, are about six weeks of age rich uh, sexual maturity. Every four or five days they have a, an extra cycle. They, uh, to give birth after fertilization, is about three weeks. And depending on the, on the strain, we, we may have up to 10 or more, more parts. Many information regarding physiology we, you, you will find here. Okay. Uh, I can give you the presentation later if you want, so don't uh, run copying all the information that is here, okay? I see that you are writing all, <laughs> all the sites, yeah? Uh, so the, the, the mice, they have 19 pairs of somatic chromosomes plus the two X and Y and Y chromosome. So they have 40 chromosomes, they have about 22,600 uh, genes, more or less, coding genes, and then they have a big number also of non-coding genes that are divided in small, long, and miscellaneous non-coding genes. These numbers, more or less, are, these are the numbers today, because this is that information we have in September of last year, but they are not stable in the sense that researchers are continuously finding new genes, new non-coding genes, especially. So we can see here what was the picture, what was the situation in 2012. So this is six year difference. So we have more or less the same number of, uh, of coding genes, but the non-coding genes were 11,000 and now we have almost 16. So we are continually uh, finding new genes non-coding genes, and a new function to DNA that previously was not known. So this is more or less the, the, the situation. As I mentioned before, we want to model humans uh, using animals. And if we look at, at the evolutionary tree like this one, let's say mice that are this group more or less, and here we have the, the, the humans, they, we, we separated in evolution about 90 million years ago. Yeah. So, by this reason, we are close, but we are not the same. So many genes are, are conserved, but not all the genes are, are, are conserved. But in any case, we can use the animals to study. This is a, a, a scheme showing the synteny. Synteny indicates just the position of chromosomal regions in another species. So uh, we, we have, for example, if we select the chromosome 4 in, in mice, where it is in the human uh, chromosome. So we find a piece that is here, another piece that is here, 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 and we can do so with all the genes with all, all the chromosomal regions. So most of this is conserved. You can see that about 75% of the mouse genes have ortholog. We are going to see next what, what is an ortholog. Yeah? And uh, more or less, the, the, there is a very big uh, conservation between the, the species. The, the mouse has, as I mentioned, 22,600 uh, 22, genes, and we have a bit less, 
but we, we have more gene transcript, more variability than the than the mice. Okay. So some definitions. What is an ortholog? This is very useful when we talk about genetics and we are studying the function of genes because orthologs it is much easier to show with examples. So orthologs are we are talking about the same genes in different species that are derived from a common ancestral. As we can think about the beta globin gene, when we talk about the beta globin gene in the mouse or we talk the beta globin genes in humans. The beta globin gene in mouse is orthologue of the beta globin gene in human. Okay? And paralog. Paralog are homologous genes within a single or eventually different species that have been originated by a gene duplication event. So if we talk about the alpha globin gene and the beta globin gene in human, in the same species, then they are paralogs because they are derived from the same. Uh, original uh, gene. And homologs, for example, they are all the globin genes. Yeah? Is it clear this? So if we see this in an example, then we have the ancestral gene that at a certain point in, in evolution there was a gene duplication and this gene was duplicated into gene A and B. We are still in the same species. And then at a certain moment because of some let's say, a characteristic of what happened in, in, there was speciation. So, from this uh, ancestral animal, we generated two different species. The species one and the species two. And originally was the species zero. So, if you, I talk, uh, uh, let's say, what is A1 to A2? Anyone can answer me? Absolute. This is orthodox. Okay, what is A1 to B1? Par. Okay, great. And what is B1 and B2? They are orthologs, so we already said. Okay, and what is A1 to B2? A1 to B1, we said that they are parallel. Okay, what is A1 to B2? It is homologous as well, and could be also considered also parallel. Okay? Yeah, this is, I have to admit that this is not my real field of. Uh, and, and I also thought initially, like you mentioned, that they are homologous. And I found this paper that is in a good journal uh, in which they consider that A1 to B2 parallel. Okay? And, and what happened in the other case, in which the duplication of the gene was after speciation? So we have A1 and A2. We have, sorry. We have speciation, and after speciation, the gene divided or just uh, duplicated into A2 and B2. Yeah? So we have A1 and A2 and B2 in two different species. This species does not have B1, has only A1. So in this case, A2 and B2 are orthologs, as we already mentioned here with A1 and B2 or A2 and B2. So this is the same case. And A2 and B2, A2 and B2, this, sorry, A2 and B, A2 and B2 are parallel, are orthologs of A1, and these two are parallel of each other. Okay, yeah. So this is the the idea. And all of them, since the ancestral gene was the same, they are all homologous. Okay. So this is what happened in mice. We can analyze mice and. Well, they, they have a, a, a very good olfaction sense, so this is related to the kind of number of duplications they have in this type of genes, compared to ours. 
they, they, they really duplicated the number of genes involved in that faction, that are the red ones, compared to, let's say, to, to humans. Yeah? So, now we are going to switch a different approach to manipulate the, the, the mind. So, uh, I think that this is a very general introduction that I am trying to give you. Probably some of you already know some of the concepts that I am going to, to present, some of you not. So this is a kind of introduction just to, to, to put everybody in the condition to understand the, the next uh, talks and, and some of the concepts that will be later uh, described during the course. So if you don't, there is something that you don't understand, just please stop me. Or if you want, we can discuss here or we can discuss later. Okay? So the, the, the breakthrough in, in, in science actually was the just the sequencing of, of the human genome that then came later on the other species, and this happened in 2001, more or less by two different uh, approaches. One is the Silira uh, from Craig Venter, but that, that is a, a company, uh, and then by a very important consortium that is the International Human Consortium, so they sequenced the human genome, and this, now, as I mentioned before, we have many, many different strains and many different species as well, just to which we, we know the, the genome and it, it allows us just to try to understand much better just the function of genes and the consequences of the mutation that could be present in this gene. So the options to manipulate the genome now are, are, are many. So we have some of here that are, uh, let's say, the classical ones, that this one, you are going to hear something on, on Wednesday from uh, Helmut uh, Fuchs that is uh, making point mutation with chemical mutagenesis in which the real advantage of this is that you make mutations and you don't know what you are mutating. So you search for a phenotype, when you find a genotype, then you can attribute the, the phenotype to a mutation and after that you look which was the gene that was the gene that, that was mutated, and then you can discover, without any type of bias, uh, which is the cause of, of the of the phenotype. And this is really the the, the basis of, of this approach. Then you have transgenesis by pronuclear injection, in which you can also don't know where the your your transgene will be inserted. This you can do in yeast cells and then stem cells or fertilize all sites. This one you do in testes and eventually also ESL. And then you have other procedures that are the one in green, in which you know where you want, you, you can mutate a region or a gene specifically. And for that you use homologous recombination, gene knockout, conditional mutagenesis, you do gene target and ESL. And now you have also the use of um, engineer endonuclease that really facilitate much more the gene knockout gene editing using the mechanism that is non homologous enjoining or homology directed repair that create a double strand break and then you do your, your gene knockout or your gene editing after that and for this you can do in yes cells or in, in all sites directly in a very site specific manner. So what? Uh, but uh, show you the first example, when mutation with they start from like, let's say, 100 mammals, we make around yeah. mutations. Yeah, I, I will go now. But it was used? It's still used in this. It was used. There are very, very large projects uh, running on that, uh, well, unfortunately this year there is no one coming from, from hardware. That the, this is a large, very large facility that was built on this approach. So. But you need a huge amount of animals. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You need really a very yeah, huge amount. From that perspective, making mutation all over the genome makes no point. But... Well, the, uh, they are. You mean making mutation with this method? Yeah. Well, you have, you the ones that are silent, you will not identify because you look at the phenotype. So the ones that don't present a phenotype, they are very complicated because you have dominant mutations and recessive mutations. So you may lose 
many of them as well. I, I, I will explain now. So just a moment. So just a brief introduction. Then probably you will have more details when, on Wednesday. So this is a chemical agent, alkylating agent, that when, when you treat DNA or with that you produce uh, mutations and these are the lesions that you normally find after uh, ENU uh, treatment. ENU goes for ethyl nitrous urea. Uh, and then the idea is, uh, as I was, uh, he asked, what you do is you normally you treat a male animal with uh, ENU and then you will produce sperm containing mutation. You do an, in a dose such that you have a limited number of uh, mutations per, uh, per sperm, per uh, spermatos, uh, so. okay? Then you breed this with a normal wild type uh, female, and then you will have, let's say, the, the, the offspring of this mating containing mutation. And if you have dominant mutation, you may directly see the phenotype. And this is rather easy, logical. You can detect sick animals because you have a mutation. What could happen is that you can have also combination of, of mutations because you may have two mutations together. And for this, you have to breed afterward and try to separate or to be sure that you are dealing only with one mutation. And this is relatively simple because you do a screening that I will show you just something in the next slide, uh, just to, to spot for, uh, for problems. But it is more complicated when, when you are looking for recessive mutation, because if you have recessive mutation, then to, to be expressed in the phenotype, you need to breed two carriers and get your homozygous uh, mutant animal that is this MM. So in that case, you do the same thing you, because you, you mutate with ENU randomly so you don't know what will happen, but you can screen just doing back crosses or with the original uh, father and mother, or a father that is the one that is mutated, or you can breed the first generation between them. And then you will have some animals that present some the mutation that this potential uh, mutation in homozygous state, and then you will see a phenotype. And to detect a phenotype, then this is complicated. They are very deep. This is more or less the, the pipelines that are used uh, just to detect, in which you analyze the phenotype from many different aspects, and uh, in, in a very, very, uh, how do you say, strict manner. All you do in the same manner. The first week you do one thing, the second you do another one, and and so on. And, and then you analyze the phenotype and you look at the very end if this animal could have a problem. And this is very complicated. I hope uh, probably well it's less used now since uh, the we we have now much easier methods to mutate genes and to to study phenotypes that is the use of, of nucleases, but the, this method is really very, very used and you will listen more about this <coughs> in the course. So another way to, to, to modify the genome is just to create a transgenic animal, and this is a very old technique that has already about 40 years uh, right now, and this was created by Palmer, Palmer and Brinster and Rudolf Jenis, and uh, they inserted just in, in the first case just the the um, growth hormone cDNA into an animal, and you can see that these are, are litter mates, and obviously the one that had the the, the growth hormone gene expressing in higher amounts grew much uh, faster and bigger. And this is a very simple technique in in a way in which you. you you have a needle, you have your fertilized oocyte, and then you inject with the needle the DNA directly inside the, the, the nucleus, okay? Obviously, the, there are some problems with that, uh, in, in which, or some considerations, 
to, to consider because the expression level will depend on the type of promoter and will also depend on the integration side where it is integrated, if it is integrated in, let's say, in a region that, that is uh, active chromatin or not, if you may have many, many copies and, uh, well, so there are many different things that uh, you, you have to consider using that. One possibility we, you, we'll see later on is just to try to do a transgenic, that is the expression of a transgene in a site-specific manner. And this we'll see. Obviously, some transgenes we, we want to this transgene to be expressed in a particular moment of the development or a particular moment of, of the postnatal uh, age. And we have systems to, to activate. One is the tetracycline system in which we have tapped off the, in which it is normally working without the presence of tetracycline because we we have a transgenic that contains a tissue-specific promoter that controls the expression of the tetracycline transactivator that are a DNA binding domain of the tetracycline receptor uh, together with the transactivation domain of a viral protein of the herpes simplex virus that is uh, BP16 and then with this uh, binds to, to the operator or to DNA elements that are present in the promoter of our open regime frame, then we get expression. In the presence of tetracycline, the, it is not activated. And then the, this is, uh, we normally use doxycycline, that is uh, analog of tetracycline. And then another system that is used is the reverse tetracycline, in which it is the opposite. So this was mutated in such a manner that it gets activated only in the presence of, of the activator, that is doxycycline, and, and then in that manner we can control much easier the expression of, of, the, of our transgene. And in this manner we can use this type of system to induce expression and to study the presence of the product of this transgene in specific tissues or in specific uh, uh, moments of the of the life of the animal, okay? Uh, then, gene targeting also is a way to modify the genome. It was originally a device uh, developed by these people. These people won the Nobel Prize for, for this, and essentially the, the system is very uh, intuitive in, in, in which we have a, a construct containing homology regions that are this one and this one to the gene. We have, a, this is the, called the targeting vector, contains a positive selection marker that is neomycin gene. And then we have a negative selection marker that is the thymidine kinase of uh, herpes in the virus. And then if it is integrated randomly, this is what happens. So we are going to have also the thymidine kinase gene so when we add a compound uh, that uh, is seen by the thymidine kinase, it results in a toxic uh, metabolite and these cells die. Instead, if we have homologous recombination, this negative selection marker gets not integrated in the genome and then we select only with the positive selection marker. For this technique, they, they obtain they were awarded with the Nobel Prize. And uh, the, this is a very, let's say, time consuming and uh, you have a lot of work because there is a lot of work behind just to obtain. We are using normally embryonic stem cells that are derived from the inner cell mass of a, a blastocyst. And this can be eventually grown in culture we do electroporation with the contract that I mentioned before, and then we select the cells that have been modified. After selection of the cell, we modify, we, we amplify this colony, and we have all of the cells containing this modification. And after this, we inject these modified cells into a wild-type blastocyst in such a manner that these cells incorporate into the, the inner cell mass 
of, of the blastocyst and continued development when they, they are uh, implanted into foster mother and then we are going to have chimeras and then if we are lucky these cells that have been modified will have originated the, the, the gonads of the animals and then what we might in a second time next after the chimeras are born. These chimeras with a normal animal, this will generate, since the, the gonads are, have been originated from cells containing the mutation, then the second generation will be mutant. And this is what it is the, all the procedure that is normally done uh, to obtain a, a gene knockout or a gene modification. That's, uh, let's say, if you are lucky from the beginning and you have a laboratory that is very, let's say, expert on this, uh, you are talking about uh, one year, one and a half year, more or less. Yeah. So you will see later how easier it is now to do this type of modification. This is a chimera that uh, was obtained in our laboratory years, many years ago. Okay. So one possibility using this technique is to target our transgene, as I mentioned before, the transgenesis by random in, uh, resulting random integration. We can also do this type of approach just to insert our gene in a very specific manner. The gene that is normally used in, in uh, mice is called ROSA26, although there are others. So this is a gene that has no phenotype and is normally used to generate transgenics in such a manner that if we want to compare two different transgenics having variants of a gene or having different genes that are similar, then we insert in the same position with the same uh, strategy and those animals will be exactly the same except for the transgene that was inserted into the ROSA26 uh, And this is very good. There are also, this is called genomic or uh, gene uh, safe harbor locus or genome safe harbor, okay? And th this concept is very flexible, you will see later on, I, I, will, I will also uh, give you, uh, also we are going to have Michaela's talk later that will, will explain something about that. Uh, in the case we want to use inducible and tissue specific knockout, we also use uh, log PSI that is and pre recombinized that is uh, recombinized from the P1 phase. That is a very short, they are very short sequences that are recognized by the recombinase, and then if we have two cycles, what is in the middle is eliminated. Okay? So this is more or less the strategy. Uh, these are the sequence of the cap, of the of the site. Uh, well, there are also a, a, an analogous model that is FRT and, and flip recombinase, uh, but the most uh, popular one is, is the LOXP and flip recombinase. So we insert by by common recombination eventually, as I explained before, our CRI LOXP in the genome, and then if we if we make this animal, that is the flux animal, with a brain, with a CRI uh, strain that expresses the CRI recombinase in the brain, then we are going to have the modification specifically in the brain. But if we use the same animals that expresses in the liver, then we are going to have the specific modification in the liver. So the idea is that we have, let's say, the, 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 the logs beside that are the the black ones here we treat with uh, the, the recombinase and, and then uh, that, okay, here is the flip, then we eliminate what is in the middle. So, well, sorry, I explained. Here, here in this case, what we have FRT and LOXP side. We have our positive selection marker that is flanked by, by FRT side, then we produce so the mutant allele containing everything, and then we eliminate uh, our uh, positive selection marker from the genome by treating with flip recombinase. And this is necessary because if we want to study function of genes, maybe 
this exon is a variant of the, or, of the natural exon and we want to see what happens, uh, then the presence of a gene inside another gene could result in, in the gene knockout of, of the gene of study. And this is more or less the, the idea. Obviously, everything could be activated at will, so we want to activate this uh, in a time-specific manner. We have inducible system and also tissue-specific system, so we can combine everything using just all the system that I mentioned before that is essentially the same, in which we use doxycycline just to eliminate the exon B from the gene at, at the moment that uh, we <coughs> give the doxycycline and then it results in a tissue specific because uh, it, it is expressed in a tissue specific manner and so in the particular tissue we can activate the, the expression or there are other effects of that in, in this case we use a light and binding domain of the estrogen receptor and we use tamoxifen and the, uh, that, that is a chimeric with a free recombinase and the estrogen binding the, the estrogen receptor is normally cytoplasmic unless we give the the inducer and when we we give the inducer then it translocates to the nucleus and together since this is a chimeric protein it also goes the, the activity of the recombinase and we also end up with the same result. So these are systems that are normally used in, in research. Okay? So next regards engineered nucleases and, and gene editing. So that uh, the, the, the idea is that we generate a double strand break in the genome and uh, this double strand break as you know uh, has to be repaired. If it is not repaired, then the cell goes into an apoptotic process and dies. And there are different mechanisms to, to repair this double strand break. And the most, let's say, frequent one is non homologous joining, in which the two ends of, of, of the genome they are attached and they are uh, bound uh, together. And this could result also in the presence of small deletions, bigger deletions, or insertions that may result in, in gene disruption. There are other systems also that we use that are homology directed repair, that is, when this double strand break is repaired in the presence of a template, then we can insert this green part into the genome, for example, by a kind of homologous recombination, or if we want, we can insert a complete gene into the, the damaged region. So we can do gene correction in the case that the original gene contains a mutation, or we can do the opposite. So we can insert a mutation in the gene that was originally wild type, or we can insert here a, a trans gene. And, and this has some problems because the nucleases are not perfect, so they may have off-target cleavage. So they, in, in addition to, to cleave, cleaving in, in the right position, they may also target another region of the genome, and then we may, this may result in toxicity and mutagenesis. So this is something that we should also consider when we do. And the advantage of this is that the great advantage is that in the presence of a double strand break, the, the efficiency of hormonal recombination may increase up to 1,000 fold. So what I mentioned before, that uh, the, the original way to, to make transgenics, this one, this is based, was originally based in spontaneous recombination. And the frequency of this is very low, so you may have to analyze, depending on the case, between 100 and 1,000 individual clones to get your recombinant. <coughs> and instead, if we use this system, this system, everything is uh, uh, much more easy, much easier. Okay. Uh, there are three different platforms that are normally used. One is the thin finger nucleases, that they are just uh, uh, 
domains of transcription factors of thin finger, having the thin finger domains uh, that uh, bind DNA. So each domain by three bases. So normally we have a series of domains attached one to the other, just to target the sequence we want. Normally we, we use heterodimers and this uh, part uh, uh, domain corresponds to the DNA cutting domain of a nuclease that normally the one that it uses is the FOC one. A, a similar project with the talent, transcription activator like uh, endonucleases, in which the difference is that each domain has a, a region uh, that recognizes a single base, so we have a code for this, and we also have a code for the for the thin finger that is a bit more complicated. We have a code so we know which is the domain that uh, binds each of the four bases and we combine this in such a manner that uh, a single site is, uh, is recognized. Okay, so we, you, it is the calculation are, are very simple, so you think that here you have one base, the possibility to, to recognize two bases is four times four, and then if you put here 10 domains, and 10 domains here, just the probability is really very, very low. So with this approach, you are really able to target a single position in the genome. So if you, if you do the calculation for elevated to the 20 potency, for example, just calculate whether you make how many sites you will see. Normally, we can use even longer domains. Uh, and then the, the, a system that is actually very diffused now is the CRISPR-Cas uh, platform, cluster regularly interface short palindromic repeats. I am not going. Probably we should have a, on Wednesday or on Tuesday or, or Wednesday one talk that probably will describe this in more detail. So this is based on, on uh, let's say, binding of a guide RNA that is uh, complementary to a region in the genome. So this is based actually in base pairing. Uh, and this guide RNA is, uh, the, the region of this is about 20 bases, more or less, and has a clear site here. There is a palm sequence, <coughs> a very specific sequence protospacer accessory motif, adjacent motif, sorry. Uh, and then whenever this disease is present, then the guide RNA, there are two, this is just to modify the scheme of the modified variant that we use in laboratory. Normally, originally, there are two separate guide uh, RNAs, uh, the CRISPR and the track RNA. Now it is only one because they were fused has to facilitate the work in the laboratory, and it's called guide RNA. And with this also, we can target a, a single region in the genome. But since uh, this is based on complementarity, in some cases, if you have a mismatch, could work as well. So we also, with this one, have to consider very, very carefully the, the off-target that I mentioned before. This is a very fast approach. So this is a paper that was published, I think, that three, four years ago, more or less, um, in which very, they, they show very clearly how if they insert, they inject the guide RNA plus the Cas9 into the, into the oocyte, then it results in a mutant animal. They can do with one or with two, with more, with more, uh, genes in parallel with the same approach and then you can see here it is very very clear if you look here so after doing this with two different guide RNAs so they found 22 out of 28 possible combinations let's say having <coughs> the, the four alleles mutated so in one generation, so they, they reach 
directly the the mutant animal. We have mentioned before that you you need for the homologous recombination that we mentioned before the approach we were need about one and a half year more or less. Here with one generation you can have the animal. And this is an approach that we have done in our laboratory for, for a gene that is called OTC or methane transcarbamylase in which we generated just oligos that uh, guide RNA that were flanking the exon 2 and we injected these two guide RNA together with the nucleus into fertilized oocyte and then it resulted in the deletion of, of the exon 2 that uh, when, when we have to design this type of strategy you have to think whether there could be splicing that goes from exon 1 to exon 3 and then you have a hypomorphic uh, allele uh, that may retain function and so this is something you have also to to prevent uh, when you do the, the design of your experiment. In our case, none of them will have uh, an in-frame uh, splicing, except the one that goes to exon 5, that is to, to exon 6, like it is not indicated here. No, uh, sorry, no. Yeah, to exon 5, if it goes to exon 5, this could be in-frame, but we are going to have an inactive protein because the, the important domains are, are here in this, this region. So this is something that you have to consider. You, this is what happens. In, in some cases we have very precise um, let's say, uh, joining of, of the two different ends lacking the exon 2. In some cases we have some deletions. So this is not important. And then you can see clearly here that the mutant animal does not have protein, does not have also catalytic activity, and, and also, well, they, they die very fast because of the type of, of model. Okay? So this is an important part as well, so don't, uh, just, I will indicate some resources in which you can find very useful information to, to obtain information of Animals, sorry, one second. So you can get information. So I don't know at what time we have to stop because uh, the coffee break, I don't know at what time it was. The coffee break? Yes, half past. Ah, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, so, you, you have some resources here, indication of some resources. These are available websites in which you, you can enter and you can get a lot, a lot of information regarding the different strains, the function genes, the also in, 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 in JAX, this is a repository of animals in, in which you can obtain also, the, there are hundreds and thousands of uh, strains that are deposited there, they are frozen, most of them. So if you need a particular strain, you can go there. You can order the animal. They will defrost the animal and make the animal alive again. Just um, will send you the, the right animal. It will take some time and some, obviously, has also some cost. But uh, it is very advisable just to have a look uh, uh, this before you start the project with, with mutant animals because you may already have available the animal and you don't have to spend time and money to make the animal and to characterize the animal because this has already been done by, by other people. And as I mentioned before, you have a lot, a lot of information also in, in this side. Uh, also, there are other sites that connect human and mouse phenotype that they disease connection in which you can go also inside the, the Jackson website also you, you have a, a section dedicated to, to this type of connection. There are different uh, very big uh, projects uh, and programs 
uh, to produce a knockout for all genes of the mouse genome that is in the IMPC. I think that also you, you will listen later on about, about this uh, project. Uh, and this is the website to which you can access. Uh, and what is important for this also is that if you need an animal, they may have already done it. So you go there and you check whether they have it. And if they have, you, you can get the, the right animal from them without spending any, any time and resources just to, to construct the animal. So they have already mouse live, they have already ESS with, that have been targeted in, in all the genes, and uh, you may also get targeting vectors. Okay? But th this is a very important resource to which you can, you can have a look uh, before starting your project. This is another uh, resource you, you can get, uh, I think that's about Infra Frontiers. Uh, also, I don't know if you are going to mention something yet. So I'm just skipping this. Then you have the Mouse Phenome Database, that is also the, the Jackson Laboratory, in which you have all the strains and all the genotypes and phenotypes you you may have so gene expression of the different strain uh, and all the biochemical uh, analysis of, of the different strain uh, at different moments of the life of the of the animal. So all, all these resources are, are very important. So do not forget to, to use them because they may resolve your question before doing the experiment. Or thanks to to the information you may have you may also modify your experiment to answer another question because you already have the, the information. And ENCODE, also the encyclopedia, encyclopedia of DNA elements, also it is uh, another <coughs> resource. Uh, you, you may have a look at it, in which uh, what they are studying are, are how the, the DNA, the genes are expressed and which is the conservation between the different species, which are the elements that regulate gene expression in, in, the, in the genes. So you have also, the, originally it was created for the human uh, genes, but then it has been extended to the mice, so that is here, you can see here the mouse. Um, and then what is, in general, so many, many of the processes that regulatory process that happen in humans, most of them are also conserved in, in mice. Uh, so you may have different positions or, or different uh, or different activities, but many of them are conserved, so you have, but some of them also, they are not conserved. In some cases you may have that the gene that you are studying has a lower transcription activity in humans and may have a higher transcription activity in mice because it has some elements in the promoter that activates expression. So, as usual, when you do experiment or when, when you study mice, so have in mind that uh, we may be different to the animals. Yeah. So, conservation, as I mentioned, exists, uh, and uh, I will go directly to this one that is easier. So you have very low conservation at the level of individual basis, but if you do footprint, you have a higher level of conservation, transcription factor to transcription factor connection even higher than you see here, so you have the same eventually transcription factor that regulate the same gene. But what's important is the level of conservation is even higher when, when you analyze the regulatory network architecture, so the same type of network are acting on the same genes. And this is the conservation between mouse and human, here reaching higher than, than 95%. And this is very important. Okay. So this is, now I switch, so there are many concepts that have to be introduced. So we normally use 
can tell you so in breath strain or out of breath strain for our strain and they are different conceptually they are very different and the information we can get from them also is very different and the approach to use one or the other and the type of experiments in which we use one or the other actually they, they are also different so in breath the definition is missing but the, I will arrive, I hope. I don't remember where it was. But inbred strains are, are just animals, but uh, strains of animals that have been crossed between sisters that for more than 20 generations. Okay, this is the idea. Sorry? Breeding between relatives. Yeah, yes, breeding between relatives. In such a manner, that it is expected that all the genes are homozygous. Yeah? So this is the idea. Which, let's say, may have also problems because some strains in which some genes are homozygous may have lower fertility or may have some problems. We're going to arrive to this later. <coughs> the outbreak is a close population uh, that is made just in such a manner that most of the genes are heterozygous. Okay? So the idea is this, exactly, that all genes are maintained as heterozygous. Well, transgenic, you know, transgenic is an animal in which we have inserted a, a specific transgene or modify a specific gene, and then we have mutants that are could be spontaneous mutants uh, having point mutation, deletion, and so on. Since how is this close population? Because you make, I, I will arrive later, it's a close population because you don't do the mating as you want. There is a specific, but there is a specific strategy to maintain dogs, animals in heterozygous state. So you take 15 different strains and you make a very, very uh, specific breeding strategy and to, to reach, to arrive to, to your own breath strain. This, I will explain you later. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's not random. Let's say, it, this is... Maybe, maybe the, the name is a false friend. Because it doesn't mean that uh, outbred means uh, whatever. You know specifically, because of your breeding strategy, that all your genes will be heterocytes. I, I, I will show, I have one slide showing the, this type of strategy. Okay, then, nomenclature of the animal. This is also very important when you read a paper, and even more importantly when you write a paper, just to specify what type of animal you are using for your experiment because reproducibility in science is one, let's say, of the most important things. And it's very common that papers are very difficult to reproduce. And many details could be important to, to help reproduce an experiment. So you have the inbred strain that normally is, has its particular name. Some have abbreviation. If you make a hybrid, then you have this abbreviature for, for one strain and for the other one. So you have a B6129S, F1. This part, the first part is coming from the mother, and this part is coming from the father. And this is a way to, to indicate. Then if you have just spontaneous mutation, then you have to indicate which is the affected gene and the allele that it has, this gene has. If you have a knockout, this is even more complicated. In this case, this is a mixed uh, background. Normally, all the, the knockout strains were originally generated from one to nine strains, so from this one, because the ESS were available only from, from this uh, strain. And then you, you have to include also the allele, the gene, the type of allele, the, the mutation, and who is the laboratory who created this, uh, this allele. 
which are shared given the name is even longer, in which you include in this name you have to include all all the information. If you're working with endonucleases, then you have to include that is endonuclease mediated mutation. So try to when you write the papers just to consider adding all this information so other people can can have a, a better idea of what material you have used. Yeah? So here is the inbred strain that was missing in the, in the previous one. So the, in, the inbred strain is one that is produced using 20 consecutive generations sister brother mating or parent of print. You have to take note very, very precisely of, of what you have done. They are genetically homogeneous. They, they, they have different polymorphism and mutation, and they also may have different traits and phenotypes. And this is also very important because uh, this is what normally happens at different strengths. They have, even if, well, that they may have a different phenotypes. Within the particular strain, they should be identical genetically, although there is a minimum also uh, possibility of pedotidosis, and they should be homozygous at all gene loss time. Okay? So. Is it possible in particular to have all like, uh, homozygous genes in a mouse? Well, we can reach at that. The, the point is that when you do, if this is live, uh, you may have also spontaneous mutation. And this is one of the points that I'm going to, to, to mention here. Let's say if you have a species in, in which, let's say, you, you have two different uh, alleles for, for a variant for, for a gene, let's say, one is A and C, that is indicated here. Uh, then you may pick up one or the other, and then you generate different strains. So in, in your population, in the animal cows, you will probably have all homozygous animals, but some of them may have a point mutation in specific loci because of mistakes in, in, when you duplicate the DNA that they happen. So this is something you cannot avoid uh, directly. The only way to avoid is to have very large uh, colonies. I will show it later. So the idea is that we can say that virtually all mice are identical and they are all homozygous, but we may have just some spontaneous mutation somewhere that we cannot spot. And then, depending on how we do the breeding scheme, we may eliminate this mutation or maybe fix. We may fix this mutation. Creating after 20 generations a substrate. And this is an issue I will go uh, to, to that. So, just one, one curiosity are, are the different species of, that we are using. Okay? So these are the different species of, of uh, mice that are present. And the, the most common one is, is that we are using is musculus domesticus. Uh, that is, uh, which one? What's the one? This one. Okay? So most of the animals we have belong to this uh, subspecies. And uh, this is just a, a chart showing all, all the type of uh, mice we have. You know, the animals have been generated uh, artificially. The, the strength we are using, they have been generated artificially in the in breeding uh, facilities. Uh, and this is just, let's say, the all, all the ones that we have, and these are the ones that we are normally using, that are belonging to the 67 uh, strain. So this is not important. Just a scheme, just to show you how many different strains and how many 
different substrains are present uh, or, or are available. So another concept is this one, isogenic, uh, in which they are genetically identical. So if we bring for 20 generations, we might reach up to 99%, and if we continue breeding, then we may reach, as you mentioned, almost 100%. These are some of the most useful strengths, C57 black 6, BAL C, and C3H, and uh, they make up, they, they have actually different alleles for specific genes, in this case, this is not a guti, this is a guti, and this is a albino, okay? Uh, and also, they, for example, one characteristic of this is that develop, the, this animal develops aterosclerosis, but not all the others when you feed with, with fat diet. Uh, and these have hearing problems, and these have also, they, 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 uh, they, may, uh, they are blind, and here you can see the, the, the phenotype of those animals when you do specific uh, tests. Uh, how do they perform in, in the different tests? And you, you have here a, a table, so you can see that depending on the type of experiment you may use, let's say if you want to 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 see something related uh, to the site, you are not going to use a, a blind species, and you have to select another one, or if you want to do some test related to learning, maybe you, you have to select some that respond much uh, better to a learning test uh, as the Morris Water Maze, uh, and the same for, for other things. And here are some of the trends with some of the characteristics, and you can see that the number of index they have each one and the, the, is important, and this results in the different characteristics of, of the different strength that I mean, that's no sense. So, this is what uh, res regarding to, to your question, um, you have genetic drift. Okay, what is genetic drift? So, is the random variation in frequencies due to chance. So, if you have a population that is relatively small, 500 individuals, you have a lot of variants that, that could be present. This is a little frequency and this is the number of generations. But if you have a larger population of 5,000, then the, the, these variants, they are much smaller. The, the frequency of these variants is much smaller. In, in this case, you have some variants that are represented only in 0.3 of the population, and some variants that are present in 0.9 of the population. And here they are more or less all present in, in the same percentage of the same proportion of the population. So, which is the, the take-home message of this? That I, I, I need an infinite uh, population just to avoid genetic drift. That is not possible. No, this is something that is not possible. So, what, this is the reason by which you should be very careful when you make uh, your breeding schemes of your colony, just to avoid this problem. For example, if I have uh, what are the causes of genetic drift? If I take the animal that contains this allele and then I continue breeding this one, I have I will have the sub friend B. If I take the the animals that do not contain this allele, then I will have the sub friend A. And then I will continue to do all my experiments, or with the sub friend A or with the B. But what if this gene affects the metabolic process in which uh, I am involved, I am studying? Do I know this? No. Because I cannot do sequencing of the whole mouse genome in every generation. So, this is the reason you, you have, when you breed a colony, there will be a talk specifically for this. And uh, you, you have to think about larger numbers, or as much as possible just to avoid this type of problem. Another cause of genetic uh, drift is contamination. So, when I was changing the cages, I made a mistake. 
and then I put one animal in the case that should not be there, and then I, I have, after some generation, a substring of the original one. So this is something to be very careful on that. So, uh, and then, obviously, you can always, if you have some problem, you can do SNP analysis, single nucleotide polymorphism analysis, to detect, because each frame has a particular SNP uh, pattern. But this is very complicated. I mean, even, okay, I, I, I can see that I have a problem because I have a, a substring, but then at that point, what I have to do is a lot of back profit to regain my original strength. So this is something you have to be careful as well. So I may also have spontaneous mutation, so I may have what I was mentioning before. So I, I, I may have a mutation in chromosome 1 and another one in chromosome 2, and then if I take only one breeding pair to maintain my colony, then I may end up with this, with this, with this, or with this. So I may have four different uh, substrates, and this is a very simple uh, example. So I may also have many other uh, mutations, and, and, and it is very difficult to just to handle the, this type of thing. So be careful with this. This is the, the advice. No? So, then, uh, this is what you ask, outbreak stock. So you generate your outbreak stock from founders, so you may have up to 15 uh, different founders, and you do a very specific breeding strategy to generate your outbreak uh, stock. And your outbreak stock is, let's say, maybe as I mentioned, it's a false friend the name, because it's not just random breathing, it's just a very specific breathing that you do. And then if you have a, a, an outbreak stock in your laboratory, and then you keep on making the, your outbreak stock, because you don't renew frequently your outbreak stock from your um, source, from the, the company that provides your animals, you may end up with an unbreed in inbred stock very fast. And different uh, inbred stock derived from the outbred uh, animals will be different according to the selection of animals that was random that, and you will not know what happened. So if you work with outbred stock, you have to renew very frequently your colony from the company, the source that is uh, providing you the animals. Yeah? So the idea is that you will not know which is the genotype in any of the genes, and uh, this is done to maintain the maximum heterozygosity. And then the idea is that you need, obviously, if you do an experiment with this, the value of the experiment probably will be higher, because you, you have all genes involved, but to get uh, statistically significant, you will need a much larger number of animals because you will have higher vari variability in your experiment. So this is something you have to consider. Yeah? Um, so this is what regards the, the most widely... So what we normally use in our laboratories are inbred animals. Okay, and this is due because we eliminate genetic variability and in that manner the results we can obtain from those animals uh, if they have a, a mutation could be attributed much easy, easily to the gene that we are studying because this will be the only gene that, that is uh, uh, this is more or less the idea. Obviously, human populations are diverse, so the implication of what we uh, take from this type of experiment, we also have to consider that maybe particular. For this reason, this is my question, why, uh, 
I like, I see that uh, to make a model, a mouse model for a certain, a certain mutation, yeah. to make only mutation, to make a bread for unique mutation. This I think is, what is different to this? Make a, I can make this uh, by whom I can I can make an artificial gene and set the certain mutation and transfer it the cell with a certain mutation. So uncertain the mutation and the human cell line like human exactly. So this mutation will express the cell line like the human. Yeah, this is but instead of what? use the mouse, but the mouse is different. Okay, do you think that the cell do you think that the cell line behaves as a human? The same, the do, you, do you think that the cell line behaves as a human? You can analyze yes, first. A, a cell line is there and grows in the plant because it has plenty of mutations. Make up abnormalities, the chromosomal abnormalities as well. So a cell line is just another model that could be used to study certain aspects. But obviously, you cannot study a more complex situation that happens in an organism. Because this is just a cell line that is derived normally from a tumor of a human being. And as such, it has ma many characteristics that are conserved and also have others that are not conserved. So also, be careful with that. Because uh, some question you can use a cell line, some others not. Yeah? Okay? Uh, so, going back to, to our story. So, what happens when you receive a, a strain in which you, you want to study and then it has a different genetic background, as I mentioned before? you have important differences in genetic background, so you need to have a homogeneous genetic background for this. Uh, the, the solutions are, or you import also the relevant stock, so the right control, that is uh, what we normally try to do, or you have to back cross to, to the background you want to, to use. Or, you cross to a, a similar background that maybe you have some differences, or you maintain your colony as, as it is, but then the colony will drift. So you can use uh, uh, those animals to, to generate the animal. So these are normally the possibilities. The one that normally is used, that is the best one, is to do back crossing. So you have your animals that contain your targeted mutation, and then you want, for example, to transfer this mutation to a wild type uh, uh, background. So you start mating for different number of generations, reducing in each generation the amount of, let's say, brown correspond to the, to the original animal, till you have, after 10 generations, for example, you have just a, a, a very important contribution of your wild type uh, strain. This is what normally is done, maintaining, you, you see here it is a very simple scheme, you, you have in the first one, one from some of, of this strain and the other one from the other, and then you mix and at the very end you have all except for your target limitation that is this one that corresponds to, to the value C strain. And you can see here that as the number of generation increases, the homozygosity increases and the heterozygosity <coughs> decreases, that is, is very clear. And then, obviously, the centimorgan that uh, I, I will go to, to the centimorgan next, uh, that uh, you exchange, really, they, they are arrived practically to, to, all, to all genes. Just that, that we're back this is an example that we have in our laboratory, just talking of this uh, topic, in which we have done a, a knockout animal of the beta alucin gene, that is a gene that is related to, to the producer protein that is in the, has a function in, in the cytoskeleton of the erythrocyte, and also has a function also in, in the brain. Uh, and we did a proteomic analysis of this animal and we found 
that there was a missing uh, spot in, in the wild type that was present in the mutant animals, and we were very happy because this was the alpha synuclein protein that is a very important protein in, in neurodegenerative diseases such as uh, Parkinson and Alzheimer. And really, we were very happy, and at the end, uh, just our, our happiness disappeared <laughs> because we had this type of problem that uh, uh, the strain that we were using for back process was C57 and contained a large deletion in the comp compressing the, the alpha synuclein gene and the original strain that was uh, C129 uh, didn't contain so when we did the back crosses, there were not so many back crosses, uh, and then we carried the activity of alpha synuclein still from the original donor strain that was C57, C, C129, but our controls that, that were uh, C57 didn't contain the protein because it was alpha synuclein. It, it was including the deleted region. So this is a reason you need to do well, just, uh, many back process to have a very clear genetic background. Uh, and then this is, uh, I think, a very good example <laughs> of what could happen. In any case, you can manage to publish a paper just describing what, what you found, but uh, let's say it would have been much better to find a difference in, in alpha synuclein, in the activity of alpha synuclein. Okay? So we can conclude uh, this one. We know that genetic variants affect uh, traits. So you have to test different genetic variants, possibly because the phenotype could be different. This is an example in which this is embryonic life still, in which you, you have the fibronectin. This is a knockout of the fibronectin gene, the full knockout of the fibronectin gene. You can see it when it was published uh, 20 years ago in which, according to the percentage of the C57 black 6 strength or the C129 strength, you have the presence uh, of primitive heart here, in, in which you have 100% or 100% C57 genetic background, or the complete absence of the primitive heart in the other strain. So, the, the, phen the difference in phenotype, as in this case, it is very clear. So, or you have, well, in both cases it was in Brendelita. In one case, it died without the heart or with the heart. Uh, and if you want to study function of genes, then differences could be important. This is a case of our laboratory, in which a particular mutation, that is the UGT1A1, that I will show you later in some presentation. If you have this mutation in the C57 background, the phenotype is much stronger. They die very fast in five days. But if you have in, in the FBB uh, genetic background, they survive up to 14, 15 days. So you, you can see that the differences are, are, are very clear. So take care of what you are doing.